The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, well, we'll get started. It's 6 o'clock. Um, and before I go any further, I just want to make sure, can everybody hear me okay? Uh, if you could just type into questions, yes, you can hear me. That would be great. Just want to make sure. Okay, awesome. You might hear my fan going. Um, it's hot um, here where I'm broadcasting from. Uh, and I'm sure it's hot where you are too. I hope you all are doing okay uh, in spite of the floods. Um, and yeah, we have a small group tonight, uh, only six or so. So I am going to allow people to talk if you wanted to. Um, if I can figure out how to unmute um, you or you can unmute yourself. You can certainly just chime in and ask a question, um, and I'll be happy to answer any specific questions that I can. Um, and then the questions, when you do want to ask a question, that really typically what I do is I, I will ask that you put the type the question into questions, and then I'll get to it along the way in the webinar. Okay, well, let's get started here. Um, uh, I think you guys can see my screen. What is the audience seeing? Yes, okay. so. All right, so here's my friendly face. Um, my name is Eric Hoffman, and I am the uh, business development uh, manager, also home ownership outreach here at, at VHFA, which is uh, Vermont Housing Finance Agency. And we're a nonprofit uh, that is here to help people to uh, buy their first home. And we have programs uh, that offer um, cash assistance to help that, and I will get into that tonight. But Really, the big focus of tonight is home buyer education. It's to help you understand the steps involved in home buying. And really, my whole um, uh, approach to this is to help you to become a uh, informed buyer, so you know what questions to ask, and also a competitive buyer. How to put yourself in a good position to be competitive out there in a tough market, right? So tonight we'll talk about the basics of you know qualifying for a mortgage. The home buying process and its costs, working with a lender and a realtor, how VHFA can help and where to get started. So, first and foremost, it's a competitive market there out there for home buyers today. I mean, that's that's it, it's gotten a lot better since the the height of COVID. Um, it's it's really becoming a little bit less competitive. However, inventory I've heard is still extremely low. So the houses for sale, houses on the market is still causing demand to be very high. Um, and you probably know this, right? Um, if not from personal experience, from from things that you're hearing about the market, you know that's good news for people who own their home. But it's challenging for home buyers that are looking to get their foot in the door. So you might have a lot of questions, right? How much can I afford? Who can help? How much for closing and down payment? Are there any special programs? And and where can I get started? So hopefully I can answer a lot of these questions for you tonight. So um, if you do have any questions, again, any specific questions that you want me to address, please take a, take a minute and type those into the questions. Um, I will throw a question out there to the audience here. Um, and I want to know, are you a, uh, have you ever owned a home before? Yes or no? So I'll just type that into to questions. Okay. So most of you are, are not first time or are first time home buyers. Are first time home buyers. Um and so how about where are you in the buying process? Are you how long have you been looking like how many months? Are you or are you, are you at the very beginning? Okay, so I'm, I'm I'm seeing beginning two months at the very beginning, looking to purchase the next two years. Sometimes setting a long time horizon can can be really beneficial for you because that way you know it's time in the market, and having time in the market you know is an advantage because eventually you will be in the right place at the right time. So understanding how to put yourself into the best position to seize on an opportunity, and then not rush into something or be pressured into buying, but buying on your own timeline will end up 
having the best result for you when it comes to buying a home. And I know that's kind of like common sense, right? But that really is true. And what I see in the real estate market is that the people who are um, being who are successful as first time home buyers are having to persevere in the market uh, for a little while uh, before they before they get to that right place at the right time. Um, Okay, and we have some folks working with um, Downstreet, working with the Shared Equity Program. Awesome. So, okay, so where do you start, right? And some of you are past this point. Some of you might not be here yet, but really, you know, shopping is the exciting part. Looking at Zillow, Realtor, Trulia, but really the best place to start is by contacting a lender to ask for a pre-approval, no matter what kind of home you're looking at or what kind of situation, even if you're working with... um, a, a to buy like a shared equity program home or something like that, uh, the best place to start is by getting a pre-approval from a bank, a credit union, or a mortgage company. And so the pre-approval letter is your key. Um, it's really the real estate agents and sellers generally require a pre-approval before you can make an offer. And this pre-approval letter is good for up to 60 to 90 days. Um, but it may be renewed. So don't think you have to go out there and, and find a home within 60 to 90 days or you have to start the process all over again. No, no, no. Really getting this pre-approval letter from a lender, it, it basically it's a letter that says, congratulations, based on what we've seen of your credit, what you've told us about your income and sort of what your financial situation is right now, you could borrow up to three hundred thousand dollars or whatever they they say that number is, and uh, they that will give you a basically a starting point to now go to a real estate a realtor or go to go jump in the market um, and start to look at homes potentially make an offer on a home. This is really how you start the dialogue with a lender um, to see if you qualify for a mortgage and for how much. So one thing to remember with this pre-approval is that renewing requires an additional credit pool. So ask your lender or real estate agent for the best time to renew this. Um, and so this this letter is a, a really good piece of information, obviously, because it kind of helps you set the understanding of how much you can afford in the market. But also, like like I said, it opens the dialogue with the lender. And so this is your chance to establish a relationship with a loan officer, a mortgage loan officer at a local bank or credit union or mortgage company, because they can often help you to understand what these numbers mean. How much of an upfront cost is there going to be? How much of a down payment or closing cost? You can have this discussion and and sort of go back and forth on these numbers. There's no obligation. Um, if you if you sit down with one bank or credit union or mortgage company and get a pre-approval, you can always you could go at any time. You could go to another lender. So it, it's it really doesn't hurt uh, to use this as your starting point in the journey. So how do lenders decide if you are eligible for a mortgage? Well, they look at your financial situation or what I call your financial well-being. And they look closely at your credit and your income and your savings and your debt. So they so they look closely at your your history of in, of income. So what um, your history of reliable income. So the, the the way that they phrase it in the industry is that they're looking to make sure that you have a history of reliable income that is likely to continue into the foreseeable future. <laughs> so they're looking at your employment history. They're looking at what you're making right now. They're looking at your tax records. They're looking at your pay stubs. If you're self-employed, they're looking at, again, your past, your pay stubs. I'm, I'm sorry, your, your tax records, maybe your profit and loss statements. The more you can help to connect the dots to verify the income that you make, and that income can take on several different forms. It could be Social Security. It could be spousal support. It could be child support. It could be, you know, a second job. It could be a seasonal job. It could be commission. It could be both. It could be all these different things that can. And and even if you have gaps in your employment, that's okay as long as the total picture shows a history of reliable income that is likely to continue into the future. So you could even change jobs recently, and if it's you know within the same income. Um, same or similar income that you were making before, they can kind of tack together all of your income that you, all of your jobs that you were working at before. Lenders look closely at your gross monthly income. 
Okay. And they like they they basically say how much total income do you make per month based on your job or any other income source that you have. And they say, "All right, you make let's say $5,000 total before taxes and before um any health insurance is taken out." They'll say, "Okay, you make $5,000." And then they're going to look closely at your minimum monthly debt payments. What shows up on your credit report? Your minimum credit card um, payments, your minimum student loan payments, your minimum, uh, what am I missing? Car payments. Did I say that already? Credit cards, personal loans. And they're going to say, how much does this person, how much do you make versus how much are you already obligated to pay another debt? And so the higher income you have and the lower debt you have, the more of a, of a monthly mortgage payment you can make. And that translates into more of a mortgage that you can borrow. And I'm not going to go into how they determine that. It's on a case-by-case basis. You can uh, find, maybe find a calculator online. But basically, this is how they determine how much room do you have in your budget for a monthly payment. And that translates into how much you can borrow. So obviously, you want to make as much money as you can per month or show that you make as much money and then have as low a debt as possible. And that's easier said than done, right? But that's that's the ideal. Um, they also look at your credit score and what's on your report. They look at, um, and then also they look, last but not least, they look at what you have in savings for closing costs and down payment. They want to make sure that you have enough for the minimum required down payment and the closing costs that you will have when you when you buy a home. Okay. Um, so let's go to the next slide here. So when you contact a lender for a pre-approval, try to meet that person, try to meet in person face to face on zoom um in in person or on zoom okay and this is something i highlight here because i really stress this in today's digital fast paced world mortgage the mortgage industry is no different right more and more home buyers are being pushed to complete the application online and that may be okay but then if you don't want to you don't have to meet with a lender you could do email correspondence and get all the way through the process without actually seeing a face or talking to somebody on the phone. And that might work for somebody, especially a second time home buyer or um, somebody with, with higher cash assets or, or whatever, or maybe some more know-how in real estate. But for you, especially the first time, I'm talking to the first time home buyer, but I think all home buyers um, who aren't real estate professionals will just benefit so much from finding a person and talking to them face to face, or at least setting up a Zoom, because loan officers are loan officers because they are good at customer service and they like to talk to people. And you want to find one that is that. So you want to find that loan officer that you're comfortable with that's not going to be really patient with you and answer your questions completely. Because that, what what I have seen, despite the, you know, of course you have to have the fi- the finances in place, but. What I see over and over again is that a good relationship with a lender and a realtor can help get you over the finish line. I can't stress that enough. Um, so really taking, you know, really making sure that you connect with the person that you're working with. There's so many lenders and mortgage loan officers out there. Um, finding one that's going to be your ally will be so beneficial because you'll be relying on them um, throughout this process. And it could be, like you said, some of you said, I'm looking to buy in one or two years. This is a relationship that you're going to be starting and having for the next um, several months all the way throughout this process. When you talk to a lender for a pre- pre-approval, it's really good to know your comfort numbers. What do I mean by that? So you want to know like how much of a down payment are you looking to make or able to make? Maybe you don't have a lot of savings, so that's fine. There are programs out there that can help you, even if you have very little in savings. Um, understand, you know, understand how much of the closing costs going to be. How, you know, how much do you have for the upfront um, cost that that you'll have when buying a home? And then I think, you know, even more important than that is knowing your comfortable number when it comes to what your monthly payment is going to be, because that is what you're going to live with on a monthly basis. That is what you're going to have once you actually close on the house. And every month you're going to have to come up with that monthly payment. And so you want to make sure that that fits into your budget and that you're not stretching yourself too thin. So what you can do with a good loan officer is you could run those numbers 
what we call running those numbers backwards. So when you first meet with somebody, you could be like, hey, I don't want a house payment that's going to be more than $1,600, right? How much can I afford if I don't want my house payment to be more than $1,600? And they will happily do that. They'll run those numbers for you to see how much of a house you can afford and you know what kind of house you could afford and where you could look. And they can even give you, they can start and give you referrals for realtors and things like that to get you to the next step, okay? Um, understand what your purchase goals are. So I'm saying when you contact a lender for a pre-approval, have an idea of what your purchase goals are. Are you looking to buy a, a, a detached single family home? Are you looking to buy a condo? Are you looking to buy something with a little bit of land? Are you looking to buy a mobile home, manufactured home, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Discussing your purchase goals up front because they will have different programs that fit your um, what you're looking to do. Um, and then have info about your income and your savings and your employment sort of on hand because you'll be asked for those sort of over and over in the process. So starting to gather those those documents now, those documents to bring and to have on hand. I used to tell people when I first started doing home buyer education was that uh, get a binder, right, and print out or keep your pay stubs that you get in the mail right? <laughs> Get your tax returns, put them in this binder because you will be asked to provide these over and over again. Well, we live in more of a computer age now. You can still keep a binder. That is totally fine and, and not a bad idea. <clears throat> but you could also easily keep that information on your computer in a, in a safe place and have that so that you could send it, send it in an email, send it in a secure email if you wanted to, to a lender so that, that you can easily get that information to them because that'll make their job so much easier. Being able to, They'll be able to help you that much better. So what are the documents to bring to your your pre-approval? Well, here's a short list. Uh, 60 days most recent pay stubs or any and or any evidence of any other income, any support you get, any seasonal pay that you were getting in the winter but not getting now, any Venmo that you get based on a side gig, maybe you're a photographer, I don't know, you know what I mean? Um, any other income that's sort of, it's, it's, you get on a more consistent basis. Uh, previous year, previous year's W-2s, if you do get a pay, pay stub, tax returns for the previous two years, um, checking and savings account statements for the last um, court, you know, the last month and all of them. When I say all of them, I mean, you know, I think some of us have bank accounts in different places, right? In different lender, maybe, maybe you have a bank account at one bank and a, another savings account at a credit union, maybe you have something online, right? Having all of those statements, gathering all of those statements into one place, sort of taking a financial inventory of yourself, taking a financial snapshot for yourself to see where you stand um, with, you know, your checking and savings account statements, your, your savings, your, um, in, you know, your pay stubs, your income, and last but not least, any liquid investments. If you do have any non-retirement investments, like any stocks or bonds or anything else you can think of. I, I always think of um, Robin Hood. I don't know. That's really popular during the pandemic. It, but I think a lot of people may have may have had a little money and put it in Robin Hood or something like that. I don't know. Or Acorns. You know, anything that is non-retirement. And, and even your retirement statements, having those um, if you do have a retirement account, having those things on hand will help that lender understand your financial situation and will help them to give a better um, pre-approval letter for you, get you started off on the right foot. Okay, so um, these are things to avoid before and after you're pre-approved. So this is a list that I've compiled over the years uh, and shortened, actually, uh, to the real basic basic things that lenders see people make mistakes with before and after they get a pre-approval. One is somebody starts the home buying process and then they um, get a new car. <clears throat> and I understand life happens. I'm not saying don't, if you have to buy a new car because your car broke down, that's totally fine or, or whatever, even if you want to just get a new car. But just know that if you if your car payment increases, that's going to cut into your debt to income ratio. Remember what I told you about how they look closely at your monthly gross income versus how much of monthly monthly debt payments you make. So the higher your debt payments are, the less of a mortgage you can afford. Okay? So try to avoid 
you know, going, you know, really splurging on a new, new auto loan um, or um, maxing out credit cards or opening new credit cards or, or getting a personal loan if you can avoid it. Now, I know life happens, but um, that, that's just a, a something to really consider is trying to keep that debt as low, low, low as possible before and after you get the pre-approval. And why is it important after you get the pre-approval? Well, you're pre-approved, but you're not you're not approved, right? You don't get approved until you actually sign on the dotted line and close on the ho- on the home. So if you're if you buy a car after you're pre-approved, well, that pre-approval is no longer good. You're not pre-approved for the same amount. So those are that's that's the first and foremost thing to avoid. Another one is closing credit cards. Okay, so what do I mean by this? So you might, after we meet today, be like, you know what? I'm going to go and pay off that credit card to lower my minimum monthly debt payments. And I'm going to close that credit card to avoid temptation. Oh, the first part of that is is good as long as you still have savings that you might you will need for the transaction for, for the, um, the closing costs and down payment. But leave that credit card open because having that open credit card with a zero balance will be really helpful to your credit score because that's a big part of your um, credit score. Um, And late payments on any bills, right? But especially your credit cards or your student loans, your car payment, avoid those uh, because that can throw you off as well if you have any late payments in the last 12 months. And then spending your savings. The more, this goes to being a competitive buyer, the more cash that you go into the home buying process with as a buyer, the more competitive you will be because the higher deposit you could put down, which sellers like, the more you, if things come up and something, maybe there's a repair that needs to be made that the seller isn't willing to make, um, you would have cash on hand to make that repair. Um, Maybe, and then there's a home inspection cost, there's an appraisal cost. So the more you have in savings on hand, Um, during the home buying process for those upfront costs, the smoother that transaction can be, the more problems you can solve, right? Money solves problems. (laughs) Um, Hate to say it, but it it does. So um, keeping that savings intact um, for those upfront costs and also for when once you become a homeowner, right? You're going to want, if you can, have a little cushion because you'll all of a sudden have to be paying for broken appliances or things like that that come up. Um, things that you didn't, you know, that you, once you get to know the home a little bit, it will tell you what it needs, right? Um, okay. So that's that. Okay. So I want to take a step back and just talk about the home purchase process for a minute. So this is, we just talked about like how to qualify for a mortgage, what they look for, getting started, that first step. Now, this is a, a, a sort of a, a bird's eye view of the home purchase process. So if you think of it like a board game, right? Let's start on the left-hand side here. So we're just talking about the first step, get a pre-approval from a lender. And then once you have that pre-approval letter, then find a realtor and go shopping. And I, from my point of view, especially as a first-time home buyer, but I think for any home buyer as a buyer, it is just really beneficial to have your own real estate agent because just like a lender, a realtor could be your guide through this process. And like I said about the lender, it the same holds true for a realtor. Having a realtor who is good and on your side can make can make all the difference in the world for you to achieve your goal of buying a home. Um, and they're actually not paid. I mean, we're going to get to working with a realtor in a minute. So you you get you get a pre-approval, you find a realtor, you go shopping. Once you find the home, you make an offer, the offer is accepted. Then you sign what's called a purchase and sale agreement with the seller. And that's when you as the buyer are expected to put a deposit down. And it's usually, what do they say? Is it 1% to 3%? of the, I guess, I guess, is it 1%? Uh, it's not a set amount. That can be negotiated. But the more you put down for a deposit, that can be a stronger bid. Um, that's what I've heard. That's what I've heard realtors say. So um, this is something that a realtor can help you with. How much of a deposit do you want to offer? How do you handle the deposit? Who do you pay the deposit to? How is it held? This deposit is refundable. It comes back to you as a credit toward your closing costs and down payment at the end of the process. So this is just a a good faith deposit to just let the the seller know that you are serious 
about buying this house and he won't back out unless there's a good reason. And so this purchase and sales agreement is your promise to do your best effort to um, work with the lender and and get the money to the seller at the end, at the agreed upon closing date. And it's the seller's the seller's promise to take the home off of the market for a period of time to allow you the time to get your ducks in a row. <clears throat> So after you sign the purchase and sales agreement, you notify the lender, you let the lender know that this purchase and sales agreement has been signed and that, and then they will start the formal loan application with you. Really take a look at, under the hood at your finances to see, and they'll look at the property and they'll look at you as the borrower and say, are you eligible for, what? which program are you eligible for and what do we have to do? What steps do we have to take to to finalize this deal? Along the way here, uh, after you sign the purchase and sales agreement, you'll um, schedule an inspection and the bank will schedule an appraisal. The bank or the credit union or mortgage company will schedule an appraisal. So the inspection is your chance to really look at the home closely and carefully with a licensed inspector. They often come out of the construction trades and they can just take a look at a house and see uh, any red flags or anything that they you would want to know as a new home buyer, right? And so, as you as the home buyer is like, oh, I want you to find everything, and you're like, I don't want you, I don't want you to find anything. This house is perfect. I don't want to know, <laughs> right? That's often the way it is. But this is another place where a realtor can help you because they can help you find an inspector. They can help you to schedule the inspection with the seller. Um, they can really be your agent through this process. And so in this purchase and sales agreement, what we are seeing right now is that a lot of home buyers are waiving the inspection because that makes their offer stronger, right? Because a seller is like, I don't want to deal with an inspection. I don't want, I want this to go fast and smooth. I don't want an inspector nitpicking my house and finding things for me to repair before the closing. Makes sense, right? As a seller. Um, but only waive that inspection clause as a last resort. So that's another thing that the realtor will be really good guidance on. Say, hey, we have to get an inspection on this house. It was built in 1898. I just wouldn't feel right if you didn't have a chance to inspect. Because the way that real estate works in our modern society is that you often get a quick walkthrough, a reasonably quick walkthrough, right? Uh, I mean, you know, in an extreme case, five minutes, and then you have to put a bid on it. And this is going to be a home where you live in potentially for the rest of your life. You have to make a decision about a home after being there for five minutes. Come on. So that's your second chance to really pick the house apart. Um, but sometimes, especially during COVID, these inspection clauses are being waived. Crazy, right? Um, so really, something to consult with your realtor about whether to waive that inspection or not based on the condition of the house and how competitive your offer needs to be, that sort of thing. Look at that underneath that that little bubble right there. These You do have to pay as the buyer for the inspection, right? The seller's not going to pay for it. This is really something that protects you. And that inspection usually costs around $500. And you get a really nice report from the inspector. And then you also have to pay for the appraisal. That's the that's a cost that the lender passes along to you. And that's usually another $500. So I say $1,000 or so. The prices were getting a little bit higher during COVID. But you want to kind of budget for appraisal and inspection out of pocket even before you get to the closing table of about $1,000. So last but not least, if all goes well, then you attend the closing, you sign the documents, and that's when you get the keys. And that is when, um, during this, this time, you're going to be working with the bank, and they'll be letting you know what are those closing costs going to be. They're going to be giving you certain disclosures. They're going to be giving you certain information. What are the closing costs going to be? What's the down payment going to be? How much are you going to need to bring to closing and how are you going to do that? Are you going to wire the money? Are you going to cut a check? What, how is that going to be handled? So you're working with your lender and your realtor to sort of prepare for closing. And it's all built in these timelines that are set up in the loan application with the lender and the purchase and sales agreement. That's sort of the structure of the transaction. This period of time between the time that you sign the purchase and sales agreement and the time that you close on the loan is called being in escrow or under contract. And that generally is a 45 to 60 day period. So this this home buying process is not short. Even after you find the home, which could take six months, it could take a year, it could take 18 months, right? You find the home, an offer is accepted, then you go under contract, and even then, you still have to wait, right? It's a waiting game. You have to be patient, right? There's no instant gratification when it comes to home buying. That is for sure. 
Uh, but it is well worth it on the other side, right? Good things come to those who wait. How many more cliches can I say in, in this hour? Maybe you guys need to start counting them and tell me at the end of this. Um, okay, so that gives you kind of a bird's eye view of the home buying process. Um, and I just wanted to pause there because it's a lot of information. And I just wanted to see if anybody had, let me ask this question. What, if you're willing to share, sort of what challenge or barrier do you see that you're looking for a way to overcome in the home buying process? It's kind of an open-ended question, but I'll, I'll just pause there and see if anybody has anything. So one person said down payment and closing costs. Anybody else? Any specific questions that you have so far? Another person said understanding what we can afford, what we can do now, um, and what, what can we do now one to three years out to be ready. Yeah. Down payment and closing costs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, totally. You know, I feel like this is an informational webinar. I feel like I want to start a home buyer support group. <laughs> so we all sit around in a circle and we compare notes and it's a, a lot of this is psychological too. It's a bit of a roller coaster, but yeah. So hopefully this is helping you to understand the money you need up front and where to get that. And we're going to get to it. I'm kind of burying the lead here. I'm talking about the home buying process, but I am going to talk about special programs that are out there and ways to lower those those closing and down payment costs. So when we're talking about upfront costs at closing, what, what do I mean by this? Um, well, it's cl probably clear to, to some and maybe fuzzy to others. Um, let's look at a purchase price of $250,000 just for an example. So if you have a program, if you're looking at a loan that requires a minimum of 5% down, then you would be required to make a down payment of $12,500 because that's 5% of the purchase price. Plus, there are closing costs. So whenever you buy a home, just like whenever you buy a car from a car dealership, there are there are costs to get the, trans, the deal done. Financing costs, right? Among other things. Um, and in the case of housing, it can be very expensive because you're dealing with a permanent piece of property. So you've got the town, you've got the state, you've got realtors, you've got the lender, you've got you know all these different parties involved. You've got the 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 investor who's supplying the money to the the bank or credit union to supply to you. Um, and so, if you are required to put five percent down, then the total upfront cost is a little over twenty thousand dollars. There are loan programs that where you can put down as little as 3%. Okay, so there's no more of this. You don't have to have 20% down. In fact, the vast majority of people who buy homes today don't put 20% down. Um, there are pros, there's certainly benefits to putting 20% down, but you don't need it to buy a home. And it's not the end of the world if you don't have it. So you could use a program that requires as little as 3% down. So your down payment would be 7,500, but you would still have closing costs. So that total upfront would be around 15,000. There are programs out there that you could do as little as 0% down. And one of them is that shared equity program that somebody in the audience is using. So you'd put 0% down, but you would still have closing costs. So that total upfront cost would be 8,000. So you have, to have fi you have to find ways. So yikes, what are some ways to get assistance with these costs? Well, VHFA has down payment and closing cost assistance, but there are other programs out there. You still check with your lender. You still start with your lender. You don't have to go anywhere else to apply. You can start with your lender, one of our participating lenders, and they will be able to show you programs, our programs, VHFA, but also potentially other programs that they offer or that they work with. Okay. Um, and then do closing costs not count towards your mortgage? So yes, yeah, so closing costs are um, the cost to get the deal done. It's kind of like tax title and registration when you buy a car off of a dealership. So let's look at the this example again. Uh, let's say you're buying, getting a loan, $250,000, 30-year fixed rate loan. What are closing costs? That's basically what this slide is about. What are closing costs? Well, basically you, you have fees from from Vermont, the state of Vermont, you have local 
town fees. So you have a transfer, a property transfer tax fee. So it's like a sales tax that you pay to the state. That's one 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 source of revenue for the state of Vermont is that they tax home buyers. Um, you also have to record the documents. You have to um, pay the town to put the 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 deed, um, the title into the land records, and they charge for that. Um, you have to pay the lender and the investor, uh, the person that's the the person the the institution that's giving you the money. So you like you have things like an application fee and a processing fee and appraisal fee and a credit fee, credit report fee. Flood determination, wow, you know, we haven't thought about this in a big way in a while, but you see how important it is to know whether you're buying in a flood zone or not, because you have to get certain flood insurance if you are. So now more than ever, this is my first webinar since the floods. Um, tax record fee, um, and then you have to pay some things up front. It's just you have to pay your homeowner's insurance. You have to pay some interest at closing that's accruing. Um and an escrow deposit. These are just things I'm not going to get into all these things, but you get the idea. Last but not least, you have to pay somebody to do a title search. And that is important because you want to know, it's a, usually an attorney that goes and looks in the land records and looks at the legal documents to make sure that the seller owns all of the land that they are selling to you. You wouldn't want somebody else to come along after you pay hundreds of thousands of dollars and say, nope, I own that 15 acres over there that you thought you got from this seller. You want to know for certain how, what you're getting. And that has a fee, right? Attorneys have fees. Um, so all those things go into closing costs. So they are not rolled in. They're not, uh, they don't count toward your mortgage. The down payment does. It basically, if you buy a home, like I said, if you buy a home for $250,000 and you put Twelve five down. Don't make me do the math, but what is that? Two hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars that you would pay for your mortgage, and then you would ha have five percent equity in the home already from the very beginning. That's how that works. Um, okay, so why do we care about interest rates? Right. Some of the some some of you might really understand why, and others again, it might be fuzzy. So. Let's stick with this example, a loan amount of $250,000, 30-year fixed rate. So let's say is interest rates are ugh, they're, they're, they're higher than this right now. They're around 6.5%. So you see, let's say you got an interest rate of 5.5%. That would mean that your monthly principal and interest payment would be $250,000, uh, excuse me, not $250,000, your monthly principal and interest payment your monthly payment to pay back the loan over a 30 year period would be a little over $1,400. If you skip down to the bottom 6%, you see that your house payment would be, I'm sorry, your principal and interest payment, I'm choosing my words carefully here, would be right around $1,500, okay? But that doesn't tell the whole story when we say your monthly payment and what you wanna be comfortable with. So. If you're, when we're talking about monthly payment, once you become a homeowner, all of these things, all of these things are in your monthly payment. It's your principal and interest payment that you're paying the lender. Then you're paying a uh, property property tax to the town, and that's how the towns in Vermont get their education um, revenue. That's how they pay for education through property property taxes. So you'd be paying on a monthly basis your monthly property tax. Your homeowner's insurance and homeowner's insurance protects the stuff in your home from fire and flood and theft. And then mortgage insurance, which is something that you have to pay to the lender um, if you don't put 20% down. So this is where people get uh, the idea that putting 20% down is is better. And yes, it is, because if you put 20% down, that you then you don't have to carry mortgage insurance. And this mortgage insurance really protects the lender in case they had to foreclose and they needed money, they needed to get some money out of the cash sale. So this insurance policy is meant to make the lender whole. Bottom line is that all of these things go into your monthly payment. So this is the <clears throat> this is what you want to make sure that you are comfortable with. And so this is a question to ask your lender all the way throughout the process. And they have to send you paperwork that clearly lays this out what your monthly payment is going to be it does change a little bit along the process from the time that you sign the purchase and sales agreement 
submit the loan application and actually close. So you just want to make sure that you understand what this monthly payment is going to be um, all the way up to closing so you're not surprised at closing. Excuse me, my, my, my mouth is a little bit dry. Okay. Um, all right, so that gives you a really complete picture of um, the process and getting started and some of the costs associated with buying a home. Let's talk about working with a realtor. Um, and before I do that, I just want to let you know that I am going to send these slides out to you after this. Okay, so you will have these slides as a reference after this. Working with a realtor. So it's good to, it's important to know the difference between a buyer's agent and a seller's agent. So when you go to look at an open house and you walk through the front door and there's a realtor in there, who do you think that realtor works for? They work for the seller, right? So you wouldn't want to give any information to that seller about how much you could afford to borrow. You wouldn't want to give any information that would influence the negotiation to that seller. So when you are, you, you want to get a buyer at, that represents you. Okay. And so real estate agents, and so I don't know if this belongs on this slide, but just so you know, and this is a question that often goes unasked by home buyers, how are real estate agents paid? Well, real estate agents are typically paid out of the seller's proceeds. So when you get to the closing table and you, the closing agent gives that, uh, that, that seller a big check, right? Out before they give that big check to the seller, they've taken out the real estate agent fees, the realtor fees, and I say real estate agent and realtor interchangeably. Um, but so so def basically, the commission that your realtor makes is based on the the purchase price um, and out of the proceeds that the seller gets at the sale. Okay, so you don't pay out of pocket, you don't pay upfront for a realtor typically. I mean, you can have you can have a different arrangement if you want, but you could pay nothing. And so, let's say you actually get a realtor, and they don't, you know, you actually don't buy a house. You never pay the realtor. The realtor is motivated to get you into a house that you like, and because that's when they get paid, right? <laughs> uh, but they don't get paid until that point. So that's just another benefit, I think, of at least exploring working with a realtor. So how does your how does your agent? They're your agent, right? They're your realtor. They work for you. How do they help you with before you find a home? Well, they help you to apply, uh, no, understand where to go to apply for a mortgage. So you could start with a realtor, even if you didn't have a uh, pre-approval, and you, they would have a casual conversation with you. They just wouldn't show you any homes until you got a pre-approval. They can spell out the market conditions and where to look for lower property tax rates, right? Remember I said a big part of your house payment is going to be the property taxes that you pay? Well, each town has different property tax rates. So they could say, hey, I know you're interested in Burlington, but if you go right across the border into Colchester, you might have better luck with the property property taxes. Um, they'll help you understand how to write a strong offer based on the market conditions. Do we put in an inspection? Do we leave it out, et cetera? Um, negotiating the purchase price and the conditions in the contract, how to draft a fair purchase and sales agreement. And this picture right here is a picture of a really a really good purchase and sales agreement that I really like. It's actually put out by the National um, uh, Association of Realtors. Or maybe, no, this one might be the Vermont uh, Realtors. Yeah, this might be Vermont, Vermont specific. But in any case, it's very fair. It's very fair and balanced to the buyer and the seller. And that's what you want. How do they help you after you sign the purchase and sales agreement? So they help you to understand how to work with the lender, how to schedule and attend the inspection, um, how to negotiate repairs and other requests. So even if something comes up in the inspection that isn't a deal killer, it just means you could negotiate. Maybe you can negotiate the purchase price. Maybe there's something big and you want to knock $5,000 off the purchase price because something's been discovered. So these are all things that a lender or a realtor can help you with. Troubleshooting. Problem solving, providing guidance, support, clarity, and therapy, right? A good realtor is also a good therapist. <laughs> uh, it's a patience game. So that's, that's just a little bit about working with a lender or working with a realtor. How do you find a realtor? Well, ask your lender. They might have a list of, of realtors that they work with that they have seen, uh, and they often keep those lists. 
things. You could go to a lender and you could get a pre-approval and say, hey, I need a realtor. Or I want to look for a realtor. Do you, can you recommend somebody? And they'd be like, yes, you're a first-time home buyer. I know somebody that works really well with first-time home buyers in the area that you're looking to buy. They just helped somebody else find a home that was in your similar situation. Here's their number. That's how it works. Um, ask a realtor about their experience, especially with what kind of situation you're buying. Now, I will just single out the person that is buying shared equity. You won't be working with a realtor just because you're working through Downstreet. Um, and but also, if you're a repeat buyer as well, um, ask you know what is your what is your experience working with repeat buyers? What is your familiarity working with the lender that I'm working with or with the program that I'm working with? So the more that you understand about the kind of financing you're getting, the kind of purchase that you're making, the more you can communicate that to the realtor, the more they can help you. Okay. Okay, another chance to take a breath here. Lots of information, but I think it's good information. Um, feel free to ask a question. But now we're going to get into special programs. Okay, I've given you some big numbers. Some numbers that might you say might make you say yikes. Now, hopefully, I can give you some some tips about how you can find um, a way to help you with those upfront costs, especially. So, let's just take a step back here and just when it comes to a mortgage, what are you trying to do? You're trying to stretch your buying power, right? Be able to afford to borrow as much as you can. But also be comfortable with the closing costs and the down payment that you have to pay and have a comfortable monthly payment right after you purchase. Those are kind of your three goals. The rest are details. You're going to get a lot of numbers and a lot of information thrown at you. If you keep your eye on these on these three things, especially what are the closing costs and down payment? How do I minimize those? Those are questions you can ask a lender. How do I have the lowest possible closing costs? They'll have a, a way of telling you the pros and the cons of different programs. So when you go to a lender, it's kind of like going to a, a restaurant. They'll oh, and they, there's like a menu of loans and programs that they have based on your situation and what you want to try to do. How can VHFA help? Well, we've been around since 1974. We're, we've helped home buyers by lowering their upfront and their monthly costs. And all of our programs are offered through local participating banks credit unions, and mortgage companies. And so you don't come to VHFA to apply or to be pre-approved. Um, we're kind of in the background. We provide money and programs to banks and credit unions and mortgage companies, and they work with you, the bar, the home buyer. Okay. What are our benefits? Well, we offer competitive rates. So our rates are not above what they are that you will see at any lender. So our our rates are sometimes lower. Actually, they're a little bit lower right now than, than what they are um, per, for the prevailing interest rate that's out there. We offer programs where you could put as little as 0 to 5% down. This is something you'd be asking your lender about. Um, we offer, here's the big one, we offer down payment and closing cost assistance up to ten to $30,000. Okay, and we're going to get into some of the details about that. So that could help you with your, your down payment and closing costs. And we also offer savings at closing on the transfer tax. And we offer um, an income tax credit up to $2,000 per year after you purchase the home. So these are all the benefits that you potentially could be eligible for um, if you talk to a participating lender. What What is this down payment and closing cost assistance? I'm sure I've got your attention with that. Okay, now... I will say that there are some strings, right? Uh, there's no such thing as free money. I'm just going to be really transparent about that. And so this is 10, you could potentially be eligible for up to ten to $15,000 depending on your income. And what this is, is a 0% loan for down payment and closing costs. So instead of taking it out of your pocket to pay for closing costs or taking it out of savings, to pay for a down payment. You would instead get this loan from the state of Vermont, from VHFA, and you would then repay that loan when you sold, when you sell or refinance or pay off, but it's 0% money. So it's free money. So there's no monthly payment. There's no additional monthly payment for this loan. You see what I mean? So you have the you have your your house payment. You have, you're paying for your purchase mortgage, the more the mortgage that you're using to purchase the home, and then you would get a zero percent loan 
to pay for your closing costs. It's basically like free money that you're you're basically delaying paying for closing costs and down payment until you sell. And so, I mean, ideally, if you can afford it, then and don't get the loan, right? But if you if if this is the difference between you buying or not buying, you know, delaying paying this until you sell is can be is something this is why we have this, right? We have this to get people into homes that otherwise couldn't because of those upfront costs. Um, and so the the eligibility requirements for this are, can are a little bit strict. So you have to be a true first time home buyer. That means you cannot have ever owned any um, primary residence at any time in your life before. If you did, then you're not you're not qualified for this. And you can't have liquid assets or be receiving any gift funds more than thirty thousand dollars. Okay, so those are the eligibility requirements, and it's not currently available with VA. So I know that somebody, one of you said that you are a previous home buyer. If you want to hang on after this, um, we can talk about um, some other places where you can go to still talk to a lender. There might be other programs that are out there um, that that would be beneficial to you. Okay. We also have something called the First Generation Grant. This is a, a brand new program. It is funded on a year-to-year -year basis, and it is a grant up to fifteen thousand dollars if you are a first-time home buyer and your and your parents or your legal guardians don't presently own a home, or you've been placed in foster care. You or any other borrower has been placed in foster care at any time in their life. So, if you feel like you qualify for this, you could get both our um, assist first time home buyer assistance plus the first generation home buyer grant. So you could get up to thirty thousand twenty five to thirty thousand dollars. But you see that you do have to fit into these um, these eligibility requirements. So this would just be something again, all these programs are offered through participating lenders. And VHFA is one among other options. So there are other programs that are out there that um that banks and credit unions offer. And I will just point out one um, that I think New England Federal Credit Union and Vermont Federal Credit Union offer other down payment assistance programs when people are not eligible for assist. So those would be two um, that I know have uh, programs for um, repeat buyers, for non first time home buyers. Okay, so you're asking these questions of any lender that you go to see. We do have income limits. Um, so you have to be under a certain income, but they've actually gone up. Actually, they've gone up to like $175,000. So you could make gross annual income of up to $175,000 and still get that down payment and closing cost assistance. But you could make, you could make as little as $30,000. So there's no minimum. Uh, that just affects how much you can borrow. I'm just telling you the maximum income that you have to be under. And that's at our um, website if you wanted to take a look at those limits, vhfa.org. You could use it with all different property types, VHFA with single family, home, with a manufactured home, as long as it's on owned land. You could use it to buy a duplex. You could even use it to buy a shared equity property, right? Um, we do have purchase price limits, but they're very high. And actually, they just went up. I haven't changed the slide, but they went up. So you can find those limits on our limits page on our website. For duplex, it has to be existing. So I'm just giving you a lot of detail here about duplexes. But the bottom line is, if you're interested in a duplex, you'll want to check with the lender early, early, early in the process, right at the pre-approval. Be like, hey, I might be interested in, in looking at duplexes. What do I need to show? Because often you have to have a little bit higher savings. You have to be bringing a little bit more cash. Um, you could use Assist to bolster that cash. You use our programs to to add to the the cash that you have, but you have to show that you'll have reserves uh, in savings. You'll have to have a certain amount in savings even after you close, because you'll be carrying um, a property that you might not be renting for a period of time, or an appliance might be break, break down. So you'll need to have that um, that savings in there to help you with that. Manufactured home. If you want to use VHFA. Uh, then you'll it's, it has to be a multi-width, double wide or larger on owned land, um, but you could put down as little as zero to five percent. 
So talk, again, the bottom line is talk to a lender, and they might have programs outside of VHFA that can help you to buy a manufactured home. I know that um, Vermont State Employees Credit Union, Vermont State Employees Credit Union does a lot of manufactured homes. Um, okay. If you're interested in a fixer-upper, this is where a, lend a realtor can be really helpful because they will be able to spot the difference between a fixer upper that you can get a mortgage for and something that a bank or a credit union will not touch because there are certain minimum requirements that a home has to have um, for it to be for you to be able to get a mortgage for it now so, so what you'll see is like if a house is really in bad condition or it needs to, like a complete tear down you could potentially get like a rehab loan you can't do a vhfa with that or but you probably have to bring 20 percent down to put 20 percent down a lot of times those are will be cash deals right because they're not financeable so there just is a minimum and a realtor is really good about spotting these even from the listing or the initial walkthrough and raising these red flags so that you can at least check with the lender to see if it meets the minimum requirements you know i think you want to stay away from structural or you know major mold or you know things like that and the, the rule of thumb, especially for a first-time home buyer, unless you're in construction or in the trades, is to um, go for a cosmetic fixer-upper, right? So replacing that pink carpet or the terrible wood paneling and wallpaper, that's all That's all fine. It's, it's when we're talking about structural, safety, health, those kinds of things can be really troublesome. Um, when you're trying to finance the home, plus they can be um, they can be a lot of work for you as the home buyer as well. So. Uh, good to cons con consult with your lender and realtor um, to understand the requirements before shopping. New construction, we're not seeing a lot of this, but there are construction loans out there. In most cases, you can use VHFA, um, but we don't have a short-term construction loan. So in, in what you would do is you would refinance into a VHFA loan. And so again, how many times can I say this, right? You talk to a lender um, and ask them if you're looking at, at construction, but oftentimes you have to bring a lot of cash. You have to bring at least 20% down, sometimes even more, uh, to borrow that construction loan and complete the construction. And then, then you would refinance it into a longer term 30-year loan or lower monthly payment at a better rate. So this is another place where having more cash on hand um, and usually this happens, you know, what, what we see is like, this is a second time home buyer kind of thing, kind of deal, not as much for a first time home buyer. Okay. So we're at the home stretch here. So where do you start, right? Where, where, what's the next step? Well, I think the next step would be to go to our participating lenders page and it's uh, vhfa.org slash homebuyer slash lenders. Pick, pick a from one of our lenders here. We have 20 or so lenders. Um, and we uh, we have top lender, we have top performing lenders at the top here, and then the rest are in alphabetical order. So maybe you already work with one of these institutions. If you click on one of these, then you can actually um, contact a loan officer directly from our website if you want to, um, or at least get a name and do a search uh, online to see to see their profile picture. I don't know. Um, and let the lender know that you're interested in VHFA as one of your options. I want you to get into the best loan possible and just think of VHFA as one of your potential offers or um, options. If you're not ready to meet with a lender, then a really good place to go, and we actually we have an audience member here who's already working with one of these organizations. It's called NeighborWorks, and they have they're a non they're a nonprofit housing center housing home ownership centers and they have home buyer education and counseling and counselors can be really really helpful to help you understand all the resources that are out there i'm really focused on vhfa because that's who i work for but there are other special programs are out there that i just don't have time to get into that they might have for you so if you have if you're really having a hard time finding a program that works for you either to help your upfront costs or with being able to you know get borrow enough to afford a home to buy talk to one of these folks here they can help you to build or rebuild your credit they can help you with financial counseling they can help you with special programs to stretch your your home buying power there are other special programs outside of vhfa and I'm just going to give you the four big ones that uh, the state that are in the state of Vermont, and 
these are all offered through local participating lenders. So one of them is called Equity Builder. And so you could look um, for any lender that you go to, you could ask, do you participate in Equity Builder? You could potentially use VHFA and Equity Builder together to give you even more down payment and closing cost assistance. There's those shared equity down payment programs. And actually those are through the the home ownership centers that I was just talking about here. So they're located throughout the state of Vermont. So in, in the um, Burlington Champlain, um, Champlain, Lake Champlain area, it's Champlain Housing Trust. There's out in the Northeast Kingdom, it's Rural Edge. Um, there's Neighbor Works of Western Vermont in the um, Addison, Rutland, Bennington area. And then there's Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust in the Wyndham and Windsor area. So they're all spread around the state and they all have these um, programs that can help folks. There's rural development. This is that 0% down payment option I was talking about. And this is offered through participating lenders. And then last but not least, if you are looking for a manufactured home, there's a down payment assistance program that helps people to buy manufactured homes and that's through get that's through champlain housing trust but it's a statewide program okay so those, those are that's just that's just i'm just giving you those that and you can take it from there right um but you can always ask a lender do they participate in these programs okay here's the last slide and i just i never want to end a slideshow without saying this is that if you ever feel like you're treated unfairly um based on race, religion, gender, age, marital status, any of these protected classes, fair housing is a right. And there is an organization out there that works with um, law enforcement, but also can just be there just to hear your story and, and understand how you can navigate it if you ever feel like you're treated unfairly based on one of these um, uh, protected classes. So I'll give you these slides so you have this and, and the other slides as well. Okay, I'm Eric Hoffman, and you can reach out to me if you have a question. Um, Email me at BHFA homeownership at bhfa.org. Either me or my colleague will get back to you uh, with a question that you have. So I'm happy to provide any um, guidance to you in this process. Um, and I'll stay on for a couple more minutes here if anybody has any last minute questions. Thank you all so much for your time tonight. I know it's a beautiful afternoon. And so uh, thanks for spending it here. I hope it was helpful. Anybody have any questions? Otherwise, you can email me. Yeah, question about first generation. Ah, uh, let's see, how does that work? Okay, so if your spouse is going to be on the loan, then, and they presently own the home, then you would not be a first generation. Oh, is there a good, is there a place to get reviews on lenders? There really isn't. Um. I wish there was. I would just recommend going to our participating lender. We, that we have a good, a fair amount of lenders that are spread throughout the state. And I think that they, um, the top lenders, you'll find good customer service. With them, you'll find good LOs. It depends on your specific situation. Um, what area of the state are you looking to purchase in? Yeah, Wyndham County. Okay. Um, a good person in that area actually is through M&T, um, Kathy Eakins. So if you went to our website and went to M&T Bank, you could talk with Kathy Eakins down there. Another one is Brattleboro Savings and Loan. Those are two of our participating lenders down there. And, and Brattleboro Savings and Loan actually has more programs than M&T right now. So I think starting with Brattleboro Savings and Loan, but also Vicki, if you haven't already, talk with Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust down there. 
um, because that's the home ownership center in your area. And I think they might be able to help you because I think you're a repeat buyer, if I'm not mistaken. So I think they might be able to, where is that? There. They might have a list of lenders that would have programs. Mascoma Bank is also another lender. Now they are just they are they have just signed up to become a participating lender, so they don't work with VHFA, but they might also um, they might also be a good lender. So I'll say M and T, Kathy Eakins. I just I really like Brattleboro Savings Alone has a lot has more programs than M and T, and then Mascoma also has programs outside of VHFA that might work for you. Okay. Um, and that class, even though it's $99, it is worth it, I think, because you'll get to talk, you'll get a chance to talk to a counselor. Um, and that's just another person to add to your team. Um, and they will have referral lists of, uh, realtors and lenders that you could potentially go to. Okay. All right. I think I'm going to wrap up. Any further questions that you have, um, you can contact me at BHFA Home Ownership at vhfa.org, and I'm happy to answer. Thank you all so much, and have a great night.